I want us to share the word of God. If you can turn with me the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 2, from, uh, I'll read from verses 27, because my brother read some part of it, but I want to read from verses 27 just briefly, and then we embark on what the Lord has placed in my heart to share with us this afternoon. The Bible says in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 2, from verses 27 to 28, then we jump to 35 and 36. And there came a man of God unto Eli and said unto him, Thus says the Lord, did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer mine altar, to burn incense, to win an effort before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel. Verses 35 and 36. And I will raise me a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house and he shall walk before mine appointed forever. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left in thine house shall come and crouch to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread and shall say, Put me, I pray thee, into one of the priest's office that I may eat a piece of bread. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that as I bring this word, connect me to my listeners, O oh God. That which you want us to get this afternoon, oh God, pray that it will come out clearly. In a simple way, the Lord, somebody in this congregation may be blessed. I thank you and I worship you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. By the grace of God this afternoon, I want to share with you on a very simple topic the worthless spirit. The worthless spirit is unprofitable spirit. The worthless spirit is a spirit that has got no use. And by the grace of God, we'll be sharing about that topic, the worthless spirit. And I'm praying that God will connect you to me as I share. Because my desire and my prayer is that after this sharing, somebody in the congregation should connect with God and understand the mind of God, which is very, very clear. You'll agree with me that there are many spirits in operation today in the world. Many spirits are operating in the world today. One of the Bible is cautioning us to test every spirit. And you'll agree with me, all the spirits operating in the world today have one main agenda. To cause the children of God rebel against God and his commandments. That is the work of the spirits we are talking about. Their main agenda is to cause the children of God men and women of God who are created in the image of God to rebel against God and against his commandments. My prayer and desire is that God will open your eyes, God will open my eyes to see or understand the spirits operating in this end time in different spheres of influence. That is my prayer, child of God. That God will open your eyes, will open my eyes to see the spirits operating in various spheres of life as we are talking today. You will agree with me 
that it is becoming more difficult today than ever before for the voice of the church to be taken seriously. It is becoming more difficult that when the church speaks, it's like nobody wants to listen to the church. And we ask ourselves, where did we go wrong? Recently, some two weeks ago, we were in a conference in Nairobi, African Arise. Now, own bishop had a chance to share. And he shared on a topic that really touched my heart. He said, the merchants are coming. The merchants are already with us. And he said, the merchants are coming for three main reasons. Number one, they are coming for our soil. Number two, they are coming for our sweat. And number three, they are coming for our soul. And he emphasized and said, the two parts are kind of being taken care of. The minister or the cabinet secretary of lands is taking care of the issue of soil and all those kind of, kind of things. The ministry of labor is also taking care of the issue of our sweat. At least we are fighting for good labor and all those kind of things. But he said, nobody, nobody is bothered about what our people receive around when it comes to spiritual things. Many people are coming, but whatever they are coming with, nobody cares about that. As long as they say, we have a good deal and this can help your nation, they don't tell us anything about the spiritual part of it. And uh, he said, if there's a time for the church to rise on the occasion, this is the time. And somebody by the name Thomas Edison once said, when a man dies, if he can pass enthusiasm him along to his children, then he has left them an estate of incalculable values. In other words, if a man can die today and he passes enthusiasm him along to his children, then he has left them an estate of incurable or incalculable value. And my question to us this morning, even as we look at this beautiful story we have just read, what legacy are you passing to your family? I'm happy with what the Gideons are doing. I'm happy, I'm happy to see what the Gideons are doing all over the world, just for the sake of you and me. To see that this living word of God is placed in the hand of every man and woman of God. I'm very happy. But my question is this. What legacy are you passing to your family? What values are we handing to the youths of our nation? There's something that shocked me. There's a magazine I was reading about a scheme by some known or unknown entities that are trying to undermine the family unit as defined by God. And this opened my eyes to say, church, if there's a time to pray and seek God, this is the time. And as a church, I want to believe we have a role. We need to be proactive in steaming up this onslaught we are seeing the devil doing in many families or family institutions today. And as we'll be looking at this story, my desire, my prayer is that we may connect with what God wants from us as his children. I don't know if there are fathers in the house this afternoon. If you're a father, just lift up your hand. I'll ask you to follow your hand up if you're a father. If you're a father, just stand up. Fathers, as we are standing, I want to encourage us. It is time to claim our God given mandate of our family if we are going to see the church be what God wants it to be. This is my word for you. That it is our time to claim our God given mandate. We have been sitting on the fence for very long. But time has come for us as fathers to claim our God given mandate. And in that line, fathers, on 28th September, we are launching that book, The Awakening Giant. There's some giants sleeping in us, and there are books available. 
We want you to be part of that because we want to go back where we belong. You can have your seats. If you look at the rate of crime, insecurity, incarceration, drug abuse, teenage pregnancy, poverty, you ask yourself so many questions. Where did we go amiss? Where did we miss the line? What happened at what particular time? Remember, I'm speaking to you this afternoon about the spirit that is worthless. The spirit that has got no value. The spirit that has got no use. This is the spirit that kills the good intention of mission. This is the spirit that is corrupt. This is the spirit that is wicked. The spirit of the devil. That is the spirit I'm speaking on this afternoon. And unless the body of Christ arise and fight this spirit, we may have many fellowships, but with less impact or no impact at all. We may have more members in church, but they are not felt in the society because of this spirit of worthlessness. And I'm here to challenge you in Jesus' name. And as I'm talking, picture the church of hell. He was the high priest in that church. The sons were the priests. But things were happening that you cannot even mention to Ethan outside there. And as we look at the story we have just read, if you'll turn with me in the same book we have just read, 1 Samuel chapter 2 from verses 22. I want us to look at Heli and his two sons because there's something being spoken about this family. The Bible says Heli was a high priest. You know, to be a high priest, that is a, an office of honor. And Heli was doing the much he could as a high priest because if you read from chapter 1, we are seeing Heli in the temple. Even when Anna is coming to pray and ask God, remember me with a child. El is there doing his priestly responsibility. And I remember the Bible telling us that Eli told the lady, may God answer you according to your heart desire. But as Eli is doing all this work, the sons are also there doing the work of the priests. And we'll be seeing what is happening with these children of Eli. And we are told Eli had two sons, that is Ophin and Phineas. Eli was a very old man. The Bible says he was about 98 years old. And one thing that uh, encourages me, that despite the fact that Eli was old, we are told that as a father, he knew about the evil ways of his son, but in nothing more than to scold them about it. Eli knew very well what was happening. He knew that the sons were not doing it right. In the, in, the, in the house of the Lord. He knew that the sons were not doing it the way God wants things to be done. But the problem with Eli, he just asked them and told them, what you are doing is not right, my children. It is not right what you are doing. And as you look at the two sons of Eli who are priests, the Bible tells us Eli's own son did not submit to their father's supervision as Samuel did. If you're a good reader of the Bible, you'll see the moment Samuel was taken into the temple. Samuel was very submissive to Eli because he knew why he was taken to that temple. But the sons of Eli were not submissive to their father's supervision. They were priests at the tabernacle but they didn't have a spirit of submission. They couldn't hear the voice of their father. The father could speak and tell them, my children, what you're doing is right, wrong. But they couldn't hear what their father was saying. No one that the Bible calls them, they are sons of Belial. This is a term of derision, which means wickedness, worthlessness, so these sons of Eli were wicked sons. 
They were worthless men. They had no value. They had no profit at all in the church where they were. And the Bible says they had no fear of God in them. They were living a careless life. A life of irreligiosity. That is the kind of life they were living. And the Bible says they knew no Jehovah. You know the Bible says, not even the Bible, our mission statement is to know God and to make him known through evangelism and what? And discipleship. And these sons of God who are serving in the church, the Bible says they knew not Jehovah. They did not know Jehovah, thought they were priests. This is to tell us you can be a pastor, you can be an evangelist, you can be an elder, you can do some activities in the church without knowing Jehovah. Because we are seeing from the story that these sons were priests in the house of the Lord, but they did not know Jehovah. They were living life that was loose. They were loose in their actions. They were strangers of power of religion. In other words, there were more professions or professional in whatever they were doing. They knew that after this we can do this, after this we can do this. That was very good. But inside, they were missing that heart doing things that comes from the Lord. The sons of Eli did not know their own legal rights. Let me tell you, church, this afternoon, as we are here this afternoon, you need to know who you are and whose you are and where you belong. Because when you understand whose you are and who you are, then you will know who is you. Imagine you are in a congregation in that church of Eli. Eli is the high priest. You are priest in that church. You are helping in everything that is happening in the altar. But you don't know your legal light as a child of God. It's a very, a very frustrating situation. It's a very terrible situation that cannot even be mentioned. The Bible says they had no respect for honor of ministering to the Lord. They had no respect. And the reason we will see why they had no respect for honor in ministering to the Lord. I want to tell us that to be a Christian is a privilege. To be a member in a church like this is a privilege. And if you lose that or abuse that privilege, you are missing something so critical in your life. Sometimes you don't understand. By the virtue that you are here is a privileged child of God. Maybe you didn't know. And because of that, you need to align your life with God and understand what is God's will concerning my life. What is God's intention concerning my life? Because if you don't do that, you will live a life of no respect for honor of ministering to the Lord. And when we talk about ministering to the Lord, it involves a lot of things. When you are lifting your hands to worship the Lord, you are ministering to the Lord. When you are kneeling down to pray, you are ministering to the Lord. When you are opening your Bible to read, you are ministering to the Lord. When you are giving your tithes and offering, you are ministering to the Lord. And unless you are connected with the mind of God, it can be very difficult for you to honor what you are doing to the Lord. And this takes me to my next point, the abused privileges. From verses 23 to 25 of 1 Samuel chapter 2, we are seeing these men abusing the privileges they had. The Bible is very clear. The Bible says, they broke the laws of offerings and sacrifices by stealing people's sacrifices by force. If you're a good reader of the Bible, you can see from verses 12 to 17. 
priests were supposed to take a particular kind of part of the body of the animal. And a particular part was to be burned for the glory of God. But this young priest in the house of the Lord, they wanted roasted meat instead of boiled meat. I don't know why they wanted that. Pengine boiled meat mafuta imekwisha yote kwa maji. They wanted that is chamukaring vizuri. And that one was for God. That one, the meat with the fat was to be burned so that the fat can go up as a sweet aroma to God. But this, priest, this priest, they were claiming that they have a right to eat the meat that was roasted. But I'm here to challenge you, children of God. God is calling us, me and you, to understand the privileges we have as children of God. Because in the Bible, we are told the fat was to be burned as the Lord's portion of sacrifice. These guys were treating God's offering with contempt. They didn't give any fear to God's offering. They just treated God's offering with contempt. In addition to treating God's offering with contempt, the Bible says they defiled the women who came to worship at the tabernacle of the congregation. They were more than Al-Shabaab. They were very dangerous people. Imagine you are in the altar of the Lord. You are serving the Lord in the altar. You take things that are not supposed to be yours. And in addition, it's like nothing. You are becoming jelly proof. Nothing is happening around you. Women come bring their things in the altar. You also defile them. That was the situation of the church of Eli. And the Bible says, Eli's sons knew better. They knew what was supposed to be done. But they continued to disobey God deliberately by cheating seducing and robbing the people. I'm here to challenge you, child of God. Even as we look at that church, we should come down to us and ask ourselves, how is our situation? Is this worthless spirit in operation today? Is this worthless spirit operation in our congregation? We should ask ourselves that question. Because this is a, a church set up, Ellis International Gospel Church. And is the high priest in that church. And things are happening. But something goes amiss somewhere. But I thank God. God always has a message. Because when things happen around, God always sees. His eyes are always open. There's nothing that happens without God seeing. And from verses 27 to 30, we are seeing the message of the man of God. The man of God is coming with a message to the high priest. And the message is not a sweet message. It is a tough message of rebuke. The man of God is asking Eli, Did I not reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? He's being reminded of their past. He's being reminded of the workings of God. Because human beings have a tendency of forgetting. We forget where we came from. We forget our humble backgrounds. We forget so many things. And the man of God came with a message. Did I not reveal myself the house of your father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest? To offer upon my altar to burn incense and to wear an effort before me. They are being reminded of their responsibility. That when I chose you people, I also set you apart to do something. And because God was very bitter, God stands and say, Far be it from me. Far be it from me. You know, when God utters certain words, you see the heaviness of the situation. And he's saying, far be it from me. And he says in a very simple way, I will honor those who honor me. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. 
that comes from the mouth of God himself. After sending the messenger, the messenger giving his report, now God speaks through the messenger and he says, far be it from me. From today, I will honor those who honor me. How I pray that in Setam Kisumu, we find men and women who are ready to honor God. Men and women who are saying, I want to honor God in everything that I'm doing. Because the Bible says, those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Somebody say amen. Eli was guilty as a father of neglecting his parental duties toward his sons because he did not restrain them. And parents who are here, you can be a single pa parent, you can be a widow, a widower, or a, a family, a couple. I want us to get this very, very clearly. When we neglect our parental duties, two things happen in our life. Number one, God takes away his favor from us. He takes away his favor from us. Number two, the Bible tells us the sons would die the same day. In other words, some, some uncomfortable things will take place. That's what the Bible is saying. That the message came and told Eli, because of neglecting your parental duties, I'm taking the favor out of your sons. And in addition to that, your two sons will die the same day. You look at Samuel. The Bible says, and Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. When you are connected with God, the favor of the Lord will rest upon your life. And I'm here to challenge you, children of God. As we pray together this afternoon, as we look at the spirit of worthlessness, I want us to look at the place of parenting in fulfilling God's mission. Because the critical thing is to fulfill God's mission. What is the place of parenting in fulfilling God's mission? Let truth be told, parenting carries grave consequences if we neglect our responsibility. And I thank God, the majority of us who are seated here this afternoon are parents, but let truth be told. Parenting carries grave consequences if we neglect our responsibility. You know, if you look at the life of Eli, Eli was very successful in supervising Samuel at the church. But he was not very diligent as he could have been toward his own sons. He was very successful in supervising Samuel who was brought in the church by the mother. But he was not very careful or very diligent as he could towards his sons. And we are living at a dispensation where there are so many things that we do that might look to be very good and might be worthy of our time, worthy of our attention, but we ought not to neglect our responsibility toward our families because of our devotion to other activities. We should not do that. Yesterday, by the grace of God, I took a team to visit the juvenile just next, next to us down here. And after dancing and, and praying with them, we decided to divide them into small groups because some of them were fearing to talk. But we just wanted to know, how did you come here? For these three months, six months, nine months, you'll be here. How did you manage to be here? And the answers we were getting, most of the answers, was that my father did this, my father did this, or my mother did this. And one of the sad stories of a young girl whose hands were burned and the, the, the mkono yani me kunjana kabisa and uh, this lady couldn't speak in front of other people and she said I want to go aside with one of you and explain to you what happened why I'm here 
And this lady spoke to one of us. And she said, the reason why I am here, my father burned my hands because he says I stole ugali in the kitchen. And that's how my hands are the way they are. And because of that, this young lady, she's around, I think, 11 now or 10, she decided to run from her home just within our city here, up to this place. It's a very sad story. So when you talk about our place of parenting and fulfilling God's mission, we need to understand what is our place, where is our role. And once we understand that, that becomes a blessing. No wonder somebody once said, no other success can compensate for failure in the home. No other success. We can be successful, which is good. We need to be successful. But if our homes fail, no other success can compensate for failure in the home. There's a true story being told, and possibly you've heard of this story, of a lady who was married to a man. And this man used to be very tough on this lady. But the lady was born again. Every time the man comes to the house, he could beat this person. He could do whatever he could over this lady. And the day come, came and she told this lady, I'm giving you seven hours to quit my home. And this lady looking at what they had already got, those tangible things. He looks around, he sees the buildings, sees good cars, he sees beautiful things around there. And this lady realized that nothing can compensate for failure in a home. And when this man came drunk, as he was coming in the house, he was so drunk that he couldn't understand himself. This lady just waited for some time and this man went sleeping and the lady took one of the pickup that they had and took a very nice mattress from their bedroom and put behind the pickup and he called the shamba boy and told the shamba boy I want you to help me carry my husband to this car so she took the husband and uh, she drove to their rural home reaching morning this mze sobered up and as he was opening his eyes, he realized, this is not my house I left in a particular place. And he called them, the lady, Mama so-and-so, where am I? And Mama so-and-so ran and told him, Daddy, you told me to pick everything that I love. When I looked around, I didn't love the car. I didn't love the building. I didn't love ABCD. The thing that I loved was you. And that's why I have come to you to this place. Then they just knelt down and said, pray for me. I want to receive salvation. Praise the Lord. It is critical children of God. When we understand that we are parents, when we understand our place as children of God, we cannot compensate our homes with other successes. Those successes are good because we have to leave a legacy behind. We have to leave a heritage, a heritage behind. But we cannot compensate the failure in our homes with successes. Somebody say amen. I want to say this for parents who are listening to me. We have a serious responsibility responsibility to teach our children the principles of the, of, the, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because failure to do this, we face the consequences of neglecting the sacred obligation we have been given by God. And this is what is happening. If you get time, please read the book of 1 Samuel and see the consequences that came. After Eli failing as a father, as a high priest, look at the consequences that followed Eli. The two sons died. One of the ladies was pregnant and something happened. Many things happened around there. You can read the story to get the, 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 real, the real story that is happening. But what I'm trying to say is this child of God. God's original plan since the creation of heavens and the earth. God's original plan for childbearing 
was that fruitfulness is expected. If you look at the book of Genesis 1, 27 to 28, we see the original plan for childbearing was that fruitfulness was expected. That was the expectation of God. In other words, God expected to, to see some fruits, some usefulness, some pro pro profitability in these children. We need to be men and women who can bear fruits. Men who can be fruitful because when a tree is not fruitful, the Bible says it is worthless. And that's why when Jesus was coming from a particular place, he saw a very big tree and he thought if I go there, I can, I can get some fruit. But to his amazement, when he went closer to the tree, he realized the tree had no fruit. And Jesus just cast the tree. That's the seriousness of it, child of God. And I want to say this. Childbearing is a blessing, not a sorrow. When God blesses you with the children, you need to count it a blessing, not a sorrow. Well, I know those parents who have done their very best. They have tried all they can to make sure that their children become that godly generation. And sometimes possibly it doesn't work and you're wondering why. Thank God you have played your part. But for those who have not played their part, the Bible says, God is seeking for a godly seed. In the book of Malachi 2.15, God is seeking for a godly seed. And this godly seed can only come when we as children of God play our rightful place in the kingdom of God. Somebody say amen. I want to finish by showing us some of the effects and benefits of improper child upbringing. Remember we are talking about the worthless spirit. The spirit of wickedness. The spirit of corruption. The spirit of the devil. The spirit that is of no use and profitable. We are talking about that spirit. And as we talk about that spirit, I want us to see some of the effects and the benefits of upbringing. I want to say this child of God, it is critical to know that God is a faithful God. Possibly as I bring this message, you're saying, after all, me, I'm just alone. But let me tell you, by the grace of God, there are people that God brings along your way. There are people, there are children of your neighbors. There are children of where you're doing your business. They always come along your way. And as a child of God, you should know your place and say, God, help me to bring this child you're bringing along my way to the knowledge of you. And as I was preparing, I realized there are certain effects of childbearing. Number one, on the child himself. When a child is not brought up in a way that glorifies God, there are certain things that will happen. If you read the book of Jude 10 to 15, you'll see what is happening to children who are growing without proper upbringing. You'll see what is happening in their life. It was the other week we had the prison training and the facilitator was telling us most of the people who are in prison most cases nearly 80 percent is because of wrong upbringing and they gave a good illustration they said for example maybe your father is taken to prison for 20 years and you are you remain behind when your father is in the prison for 20 good years you are not sensing any parental, whatever. The mom is struggling and all those kind of things. You'll find the same, same children will also possibly be taken to prison because of lacking that parental part of it. So we are saying there's an effect. When children are not brought up well in the way of fearing God, there's an effect on our children. We also sing the effect on the parents themselves. From the story we are reading, the Bible says from verses 30, 
that the Bible says through the man of God that from today I will honor those who honor me and despise those who despise me. And we are seeing the situation of Eli. Eli is told from today in your house you will not see any old man. That's a serious statement from God. In this house that are chosen, in this house that are set apart to be my priest, you will not see an old man in this house. It was a terrible one. And in addition to that, he's told your two sons will die at the same time. How can you feel as a parent? The message comes to you that because of negligence, your two loved daughters or your two loved sons are going to die at the same time. That's the situation Eli is finding himself. It was a very serious situation. And this is because of wrong upbringing of the children. We also see the impact on the church itself. When children are not raised up well, because the truth of the matter, they will still come to church. But when they come to church, because they are not brought up very well, they will come and do the activities of the church minus knowing God. Which is a serious situation. Because these sons came to the house of God. They were the sons of the priest. But because they knew not God, the church also was affected. The church had problems. Because from home, the parents didn't take their responsibility well. And when the children came to the church, and because they were children of high priest, they were given that high priest I priest honor and they became priests also. The society was also affected because of poor child upbringing. Let us read the book of Proverbs very quickly. Proverbs chapter 30 and verses 21 to 23. We see how poor child upbringing can affect the society. Proverbs chapter 30 verses 21 to 23. The Bible says, For three things the hearth is disquieted, and for four which it cannot bear. For a servant when he reigneth, and a fool when he is filled with meat. For an odubious woman when she is married, and a hard maid that is heir to her master's. Master, mistress, I mean. That statement is loaded, very, very much loaded. When we have poor upbringing of our children, the society will be affected. But my prayer this afternoon is that we, 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 we pray that God help us as individuals to know the benefits of proper child upbringing. When we bring our children in a right way, the Bible says, and there are proven case studies that will find rest and gladness of heart. When our children are raised in a way that brings glory to God, statistics or some case studies are proven. The Bible also confirms that there is rest and gladness of heart. That is the time we'll find people fit for God's holy use. People who can be used of God. Because God is used, looking for a vessel that he can use to bring glory to his name. God is looking for a servant that he can use to bring glory to his name. And when our children are reared in a way that pleases God, the Bible says they will be fit for God holy use. The two sons of Eli thought they were serving in the church. They were not fit for God's holy use. And that's why I say the worthless spirit is a spirit that kills the good intention of missions. Because there's no way these two sons of Eli could go out and tell people, Jesus is able. Jesus can do this and that. There's no way. And I want to challenge us, even as we pray together. 
When we rear our children in a way that pleases God, there's a promise of eternal reward. A wise person is a model of a meaningful life. If you say you're wise, then you should model it with your meaningful life. Then that way, you are a wise person. And as we, 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 we raise our children, we bring our children in a way that God is happy with, we are being told they are promise of eternal reward. We will see the perpetuation of God's purpose in this planet Earth. Because when God created us, he's telling Jeremiah from Jeremiah chapter 1 verses 5, before I created you, I knew you. I set you apart to be a prophet unto nations. I knew you before your mother and father met. I had already separated you. I had already put you aside. But because of the devil, when you were born, you met with the devil. But thank God, because God still wanted to see his purposes being perpetuated. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That is the desire of God. That God's purpose should be ongoing. Somebody say amen. Church, even as we pray together, listening to Ellie's story, is there a situation in your life? Is there a situation in your family? Is there a situation in your workplace that is making you too busy that you don't have time to fulfill God-given mandate of raising a godly generation? Is there something like that? Thank God for one thing. The Bible says, the book of Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, I'm just paraphrasing. That from the root of Jesse, a shoot will sprout up. And I'm releasing my spirit. Spirit of wisdom and understanding. Spirit of counsel and might. Spirit of knowledge and the fear of God. Whereby people can live to fear God. People can live under the counsel of the spirit of God. And that is what we are praying for. Because when we get the spirit of God, we will fight this worthless spirit. It is very sad when our children are drifting away from us slowly by slowly and as parents we are not saying anything, we are not speaking, we are just there. Early saw what happened and I'm praying that we can say, God, we want the Spirit of God that can give us wisdom, that can give us counsel to do what you want us to do. Somebody say amen. Just arise on your two feet as we pray together in the name of Jesus Christ. Just lift your two hands before the Lord. I want you to do something. Just tell God, thank you for where you placed me. Just lift up your, your hands before the Lord and open your mouth. Tell him something this afternoon. Just thank him for allowing you to be a parent, a guardian, wherever you are. Just thank God for that responsibility. And tell him, God, I need you. I need you, Lord. I need your spirit this afternoon in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we bless you. There is none like you. There is none that we can compare to you. Lord, it is only you that we need. Lord, we pray against the spirit of wickedness, spirit of worthlessness, spirit of unprofitability in the name of Jesus. My God and my Savior, we are coming back. We are branching out to our responsibilities in the name of Jesus.